17, uh, verses 8 through 16, I believe it is. This is a familiar story, but I, I want to share this verse, and then I'm going to just declare something over you. I want to pray for some people before we leave. Then the word of the Lord came to him, talking of Elijah, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. This is after Elijah had declared the word of the Lord that there would be a drought for three, over three years. And the Lord instructed him to go to the brook and to stay by the brook, go hide by the brook Cherith. And when the, stay there until the brook dries up, the ravens fed him there for a season or a time. And then God said, get up. And he's telling him, this is where we're picking up in this story. And so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, she called to her. He called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see that I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. Everybody say first. And bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. Could you imagine if a preacher made that statement to a family today? We have one meal left. And then we're going to die. How many have been through tough times? And you get to a place and you've got just a little bit left. And all you can see is what i got left. And that's it. And then this prophet... And I'm not, I don't want you to get hung up on the preacher-prophet part of that. That's not what I'm after today. I'm after God being the prophet. Let me say it that way. Because it was the word of the Lord. And he says, make me something first. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Elijah. I don't know who this is for or what all it's for, but I feel the presence of the Lord so strong today. It's not about what you've lost. It's what about it's about what you have left. And are you going to put him first? I'm telling you, we are at a time and a transition in this nation, in this country, in this world that things are going to change. Everything is changing from the business world to the way we do business to the way we do leadership. We had a leadership meeting last night and I explained to people how leadership is changing and shifting like never before. We are in a transitional time. We are at the end of something and we are at the beginning of something else. But what is going to matter, I believe, in the, in the Christians today, in the church world today, is what do we do and with what we have left and what, who do we put first? He said, I will have no other God before me. First. That means that just the word first automatically proves the fact that there's something coming after. Otherwise, it would just be one. Because one could be singular all by itself and stay there. But when you say first, that is proof that there's something coming second and third and fourth. And God always says, if you put me first, seek ye first the kingdom, the rulership of God in your life first, and all these things will be added unto you. And that very verse is talking about food and drink and clothing and what we need to wear, the things that we have need of. This is what he said the, the worldly people uh, stri uh, 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 strive about or worry about or con are concerned about. But he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all this stuff will come find you. I love the way one of my friends preaches it. He said, if you'll put him first, the stuff will chase you down. 
People start showing up at your house with stuff. People start doing stuff if you put Him first. But we always, it's it's human nature. We're just like the woman, the widow in this story right here. She said, I got got just enough to make one more cake for me and my son and then we're going to die. And the prophet has the audacity to say, make me one first and you'll be fine. What an act of faith that woman had. What an act of faith that woman had. And she makes him a cake. And during the rest of that drought, during the rest of that dry season, anybody ever been in a dry season? Been through times when farming's tough. Been through times when business is tough. Been through times when the economy's tough. Been through times when things are tough. I'm telling you, and I'm challenging you as a pastor of this church today, it's what you do and who you put first is what's going to matter. And you're going to see a separation. It's going to be obvious. I believe that the, all the stuff that's going on in the world, I believe it's all part of God's hand in the whole situation because you can't deal with something until you get it out of the closet. You can't deal with something until you get it out in the open. And right now, I don't know of anything that's not out in the open and boldly trying to come against God and truth and the principles of God and righteousness and the kingdom of God more than any other time in my lifetime or, or American history that I know of. It's out in the open, but rejoice, because your redemption draweth nigh. Amen? We need to rejoice because redemption draweth nigh. You can't kill something till you expose something. You can't heal something till you get to it to expose it to heal it. Even in a physical sense, when we get hurt, until you can get to the situation to sew it back up, you can't fix it. I'm going to do a little break here, and then I'm going to share a word with you, and then we're going to pray and go home. I know this is different, but I don't care. Yesterday, I got a, a message from uh, Jana, Jim's wife, that was here two weeks, uh, or last week, two weeks ago. He was riding a horse for a guy. He had been through a situation in his life. There was a, um, a lot of offense, major hurts. Been a long period of time. For the past several weeks, he kept telling me, he said, man, I've got a burden for this guy. I've got to forgive him. I've got to make it right. I'm concerned about his soul. I just, he said, I'm weeping for the guy that I used to couldn't stand or anything. He said, pray for me. He ran into, by accident, ha ha, the person a couple times in the last few weeks began to have conversations, get along. Actually, we're going to partner on a horse. The other guy was going to buy the horse. He was going to have Jimmy train it because they train rope horses and stuff. He said, I'm going to, I'll buy this. You train it. We'll partner on it. It'll be good. Jim said, no problem. Yesterday morning, he rode the horse for about an hour. Everything was fine. All of a sudden, the horse blew up, starts bucking, busted Jim all up. They had to, he had inner bleeding. They took him to one hospital. They said, your pelvis is broke. You're bleeding uh, pretty bad. You need to go on to Tulsa so they can fix you. Jenna calls me, I said, hello, and she said, I just need some agreement. She said, I'm not asking you to do anything but agree with what I'm fixing to tell you. Here's what we know. Jim's hurt, Jim's going to be all right. we got too many things to do. I need somebody to agree with me and declare the healing of God over my husband because God's going to show up. We know that's faith. I said, all right. So she told me what happened, so we begin to pray. They got him over there last night. They said his pelvis is not broke. The bleeding had stopped. They are going to have to do some work on him a little bit, but they're going to send him home Monday and told him with a walker and told him to get to moving. Amen. I've said this for probably 15 to 20 years. There's coming a time, back in my spirit years ago, the end of the 90s, even early 2000s, Something the Lord just kept stirring in me. There's coming a time in America when they're going to call for the real men and women of God. They're going to call for men and women of God in this nation. And we're seeing part of that. You may not agree with all the people that have been called to high positions to pray and agree with. But how many know I'm thankful there's some people up there that are praying to the name of Jesus in that big house. Amen. That's a whole lot better than praying to somebody else. Amen. We need to get our eyes open and get our focus on the right thing. This is between good and evil. This is not about opinions or anything else. And we, we know, I don't know of anybody that ever had it all figured out just right. But at least if we're seeking Him, the kingdom of God, 
and His righteousness, we know that the things are going to be all right. Amen? And I just have something down in me for years has been saying this, and I believe we're coming and we're seeing the days of that manifestation come in America today to where they're going to call for the real ones. They're not necessarily going to be the ones that are on TV or necessarily the ones that are popular, but they're going to be calling for people in local communities about this little old woman down here that nobody ever talks too much, but they know if I ever get with her, things change, and, and I'm going to go see her, or this, this old man down here, or this person over here, or there's some kid in high school, and all of a sudden, kids start being drawn to a certain kid in high school because they know they may be a little bit different, but when I get around them, I feel something. When I get around them, uh, there's power there, and I'm going to look for that because everything else is chaotic I don't know why it's got to go this way it's his deal not mine can you put that other thing this is the word he told me to speak over this congregation today in this season at this age in this stage in your life the fruit you've held on to has been culled And you're desperately trying to stop the bleeding. On the outside, your blessings have been taken from you, but the exterior pains you feel are accompanied by the inward agony for what you cannot reclaim. But the Master has not placed value where we have. Whereas we long for what has been taken, the Master is overjoyed with what remains. Could it be that the Lord hides the next season's harvest in what we have left. Your miracle is never in what you lost, but it is in what you have left. I don't know who that's for or what that's for today. You can shut off Facebook Live. Thank you all for joining us today. We love you.